Well, you don't even need to ask if I've missed you. You know I have. Last time out, Chris Waddle. What a joy that was. This time, the big interview with Darren Fletcher. Certainly one of the best chats we've had yet. Full of anecdotes about gigs, skulls, Fergie, Gary Neville, missed opportunities in Champions League finals. But a lot of talk with an intelligent, articulate, admirable football man, somebody I like very much indeed, who gave us an absolutely wonderful day when we visited him in Manchester. But first, we need your help. If you've been listening to these podcasts and enjoying them, I've got some bad news and some good news. The bad is that we can't afford to continue to produce these in the way that we have been. We've been paying for everything. We haven't asked for any revenue. The good news, you can fix all this. You can guarantee that the big interview will continue for at least another year. We've just started a Kickstarter campaign to raise the money we need to continue to produce the big interview. And we need you to make this happen. Plus, you can get some fantastic rewards for doing so. Go to kickstarter.com and search for Graham Hunter. You'll find a video telling you more about the campaign and details of the rewards that we're offering in return. You can pledge as little as £10, and if you do that, you can listen to these podcasts in the knowledge that you've helped produce them. Without you, they simply won't exist anymore. There's the chance to attend backers' parties all over the UK and Ireland, which will include a question and answer session with me on stage, plus loads of fun. We've got books signed by Pep Guardiola and Gerard Piquet. There's your chance to be a producer on the big interview show, to have us to do a show about you. You can be the subject of the big interview. Also, you can buy that privilege for somebody else and gift it to them as a present. You can even come over to Barcelona and watch the reigning European champions work their magic in the camp now and I'll be with you. This is the only chance you're going to have to be part of the podcast. If you like what we do, we need your help right now. If we don't reach our financial goal on kickstarter.com, we can't produce these podcasts anymore. So listen, hit pause right now. Go to kickstarter.com, search for Graham Hunter, and choose which one of our fantastic rewards is the right one for you. Go on, hit pause, I'll wait right here. Okay, what did you go for? Tickets to La Fiesta? I knew it. I'll see you there, can't wait. Now, on with Darren. It's a pleasure to be with you. The biscuits are fantastic. Thank you very much. The tea is magnificent. Um, we're overlooking one of the great football arenas in uh, Manchester, uh, your back garden. When, when I started to chat to you and I was taken with your passion about football, one of the times we had a chat, I'm certain, was that you were out of the game because you were not well, you were recuperating. And I think a couple of times you started travelling with fans to go and watch United. How is it possible to do something like that when you're, you know, a world famous football guy at the biggest club in the world? How the hell did you pull that off? Well, funny incident is we're trying to get my ticket in the Etihad. It's Man City. It's away in the cup, and um, basically where we got dropped off, I couldn't get anywhere near the entrance. So I'm walking. I literally did a whole lap of the Etihad through all the Man City fans to get to the front to collect my ticket. And how nobody recognised me to this day, I still don't know. Don't get me wrong, I put my hood up. But um, I was walking on eggshells and I could see the odd little glance, but it was almost like, nah, it can't be. And then obviously get my ticket and get into the fans. But, you know, I'm a massive football fan and I don't really see myself as a recognisable... I, I know that might sound crazy, but I just... I don't really see myself as famous, so I almost felt like, oh, I'll be all right, nobody will know who I am. And that might sound crazy to you, but that's the way I felt. And I, and I just wanted to... Missed football, wanted to support my team and wanted to take in away the experience with the United fans. Was it because one of the... Crazy mistakes God made was not giving me any decent talent at football because that would have completed me as a as a as a person. But I always imagine that if I was able to earn a, earn a living like you do, that's the kind of thing I would do. I'd want to be with the fans and going a bit nuts to support my team, shout, let off steam, because you could have easily sat in a fit box or in mm. a, whatever. What did you expect to enjoy most about the experience? It, did you sing? Did you? <laughs> now that's the thing. I can't speak highly enough of the Man United away fans. Yeah. Atmosphere at Old Trafford's fantastic. You know, mm-hmm. Champions League nights, big games, different class. But our away fans are special, and I realised that when I was playing for the club. Away from home, we've got a real good bunch of away fans who sing relentlessly, who support the team, who've got great passion, 
and are just die-hard United fans, and I wanted to be a part of that, mm. and it really, you know, it brought back memories of going to watch Celtic as a youngster. Mm -hmm. I loved everything about the game. I was there hours before kickoff. Mm -hmm. I watched the warm-ups, I sang mm -hmm. every song, I loved everything about it and it had been a while since I'd experienced that as a fan and, and when you know, I turned into a fan because I physically wasn't at the training ground and I was watching Manchester United as a fan so why not go and take in the whole experience as a fan and get right involved with the away fans? That whole experience, like for, for me, poker terms, you show me your park and I'll show you Pataudry, okay? <laughs> which in the rules of poker trumps it every time. But as a, as a wee lad going in the 60s to watch Aberdeen in their, what was then a Chelsea strip, they played in all blue, which is my, well, my lucky blue jersey was what I wore when I greeted them coming back from the 1970 Cup final. But the things that I remember were things like tobacco smell mm -hmm. from the old farmers who sat around us and they would put their tobacco in their pipe. And I, if I go up to now, they're all dead, they're all gone. Football has changed in how you support it and who's around you. But that, the smell of that tobacco and their rich... So Chuchter voices will live with me forever and that was part of the whole ritual of, of going to a game mm. what are the things that you miss about being a fan from those days that you talked about when you were young and you went there and you sat there watching the whole the stadium fill gradually what, what are the things you remember and that you miss I miss Andy Gorham breaking my heart <laughs> <laughs> I mean I was a Celtic fan who waited a long time for them to he, win something he did it over and over again didn't he I mean we used to batter them yep. and Loud drop a break down the way. Mm -hmm. He'd clip one in to get uh, McCoy. It'd be close to wouldn't it? Yeah. And <laughs> Andy Gorham would have saved every shot and I'd have been in tears crying, yeah. like, and I think I had to wait till 95 before I seen Celtic win something. Airdrie in the cup final? Airdrie, Van Hoydonk. Big Van Hoydonk, yeah. That's yeah. why I think Van Hoydonk was one of my heroes as a kid, just because that goal almost. Yeah. But, you know, going, I got to the game really early. I was very, my uncle had a director, a box, a real small one, probably the smallest one in Parkhead. But, but, but he had to get there. <laughs> You know, a good few hours before the game to enjoy the whole experience. So me and my little cousin, we had the tickets. So we'd be there from one o'clock or half twelve, waiting for the three o'clock kickoff. I just loved everything about it. The watching the teams coming off the bus, mm. doing the away ones, yep. getting yourself a burger, getting yourself a program. You know, all the Glasgow voices, the the noise, the the accent. You know, something that was different to me. The whole experience, getting in and watching the warm up, watching John Collins just to do his, his technique, keep you up. He's in the warm up. I was obsessed with that. Mm because everyone else was doing the usual stuff and he'd be on his shoulders flicking it and fantastic technique. There was an old man who used to sit behind me and I think the two tickets as well, me and my cousins weren't beside each other so basically you're sat in there, you're probably 11, 12, 13 year old on your own and I think he realised that and he used to like give me sweets and mm -hmm. things like that, his old mints and stuff mm -hmm. like that and I think he realised I was there morning and I was almost like, you know, always chatting to me, what do I think the scores are going to be and and I always remember my conversations with him. I couldn't even remember his name now, but his face is distinct with me. Do you know what you've made me think of, which wasn't what I was going to ask you next? I remember being, I was working at Carrington for some reason, and typically you looked after me and came down and made sure everybody was behaving, and that literally. <laughs> and I remember meeting Norman. Am I right with the name? Three old fellas. Used oh, to yeah, come that's into right, training yeah, ground yeah. all the time. And I was kind of thrown because it, it's a high security place and the punters don't get in. And my big thing about moving to Spain was you're allowed to watch training and you come back to England and you can't. And there's these three old last of the summer wine dudes. And then you come down, you're like, all right, Norman, I forget the other two fellas' name, but I, I believe they'd been remnants that Sir Alex had inherited when he came to the club and he just kept letting them come in or something like that. Is that right? That would, yeah, exactly. From the cliff days, I think, before Sir Alex, they, obviously, I think the fans were been more access in and could watch training. But when they moved to Carrington High Security, they were the only three that were allowed to come. And I think, basically, Norman was the one, but his two mates drove him and brought him with him, so they were part of the package, really. But Norman was the only one who watched all our training sessions. That was his life, and Sir Alex brought that over. So all the players knew Norman. You know, it was a real sad day when he eventually he was just away. an old. He was just a happy old punter who supported United. He no big links with the game, he, he wasn't a, an, in commas an, an important person, he was just somebody, what made me think about it was an old fella at Parkhead going, I'll look after the wee man, and it's like Alec going, that, that's what I was like, or that's what football should be like, I'm going to keep letting Norman and his pals in, nobody else but them. Exactly. Yeah. I thought that was what football football and football people down to the, el the barest elements, is what football should be like, I thought. No, that's, that's it, it's exactly, you know, it's, it doesn't matter what your background is, whether you can play, whether you can't, you know, you love the game, mm. and his 
love of Manchester United and of doing something his whole life and why should that stop because we've moved to a fancy facility <laughs> in Carrington I think Sir Alex realised that you know I think Norman was literally there every day so it wasn't as if he was there once a week that was his life to go and watch Manchester United train and probably since he retired every day and it was fantastic watching him question Sir Alex's team tactics and, and things like that which Sir Alex would laugh at but also go and have a chat with him and You'd walk past and I can't believe you weren't playing, son. You know, he probably said it to everyone. It wasn't playing, but you know, that's that's just the way Norman was, and he he was, you know, he was well liked and well respected by everyone. And P- people that don't know me would, would find this hard to believe, but I'm quite, if not timid, I'm, I'm, I'm I try to be well behaved when I'm in an inner sanctum, and I try. So I, so all these three guys, and I'm, they might be important. I better not speak to them. And it's when you, or I better not interrupt them. It's when you told me who they were that, and then you went, I think you went away to train or change. And I got talking, and he was like, oh. You know, I, all these stories about Cantona. He said, I saw him first. He would go out with the ball, and nobody noticed for the first few months. And he got out there on his own, and I loved it. It's just this guy just I didn't know who I was at all. Mm. And all he was doing was just sharing the oral history, sharing the memories, doing a version of what we are doing now. Just his enthusiasm bubbled out. And he also, he liked to have a little claim on even though it had been signed, was kind of world class. It was like, I, I, he said, I, I saw him, I spotted him first. And I loved that. And it was a really sad moment. You texted me the day, I think he died the day after I last saw him with you. And you texted me and said, bad news, he's, he's moved away. Well, I was going to pick up on you having gone to the City Cup to Iowa. Is that whenever I meet people in football or interview them for this podcast, they always say, how's it going in Barcelona? Will they win this year? And I must come out. Then they don't. Mm-hmm. But you did. Yeah. Just out of sheer enthusiasm for that way. It might have been my pattern in conversation, I admit, but it was a classical. Again, what drove that? Because every, I mean it, everybody says, oh, I must come out one day. Out. And if they're not working, they don't come out, but you did. What drove that was probably my love of Spanish football from when it started on a Sky. Mm-hmm. I was obsessed with Fernando Redondo, mm-hmm. and I watched USA 94, and it was like, wow, this midfielder, centre in midfield, controlling the game with his left foot. And then on the back of that, I went to watch Ireland lose to Holland in the Euro qualifier to get to Euro 96 at Anfield. And Seedorf ran the game for Holland. So all of a sudden, you got two of my favourite players mm-hmm. playing together at Real Madrid. It's just started on on Sky, Spanish football. And just by no knowledge, no internet back then, mm-hmm. you know, maybe picking up the odd magazine. And then obviously seeing Redondo and Sedorf together, I thought, wow, uh, and I fell in love with Spanish football. And then the Classical is such a big game. Just to watch at the time when I came to watch, probably two of the best teams in the world. Mm. You know, it was the Barca team. It was at the height of the quality of football was extraordinary and the quality of the intensity of the competition was mm. really extraordinary. I think it was a cup tie. It I was, think. yeah. I think, yeah. I know Barcelona definitely won the match. If my memory's right, they, they went through... Uh, we sh- we sh- I should have checked. Them. Traditionally, yeah, should I should have, have checked before this. Did but, research. Uh, we, we don't follow the rules here. We're outside the white lines. We're the Cantona podcast. <laughs> but I think they drew 2-2 two, two in, the, in the game and went through having right. won the oh, yeah, first leg. Right. And they went, th- they went through. But, you know, it got quite nasty. But you saw football of... Playing brilliant creative football when the, the battles are that intense, I think is much more difficult than when you can impose yourself on a slightly less running on it and there's less psychological build-up. And the physical challenges for Spain, maybe they were only kind of tasty-ish for the Premier League, but for Spain, it was getting pretty vicious then. What did you enjoy about that, that experience? Uh, I loved everything about it. It's one of those games, you know, if you love football, it's a classical, you know. It's Barcelona against Real Madrid in the new camp. I mean, you know, if you're picking the games to go to, that's... that's it's not a volcanic a- atmosphere, though, is it? Apart from the singing and whistling at the beginning. It's it, not. It's quite a theatre-style atmosphere, I've always felt. Yeah, exactly. It's very theatre, you're right. It's not an old firm. It's no. Not, it's not that. No. You never feel yeah. like there's going to be trouble at any point. I think that was the thing, and it is... Their passion is for the love of their team and the love of the game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. Which they can enjoy in silence. It's not It's not so tribal. There's, there's something in our blood, both in England and Ireland, but certainly in Scotland, there's something, I don't know if we're aggressive or if we're winners or we're conquerors throughout history or soldiers. I, I don't know, but you said edge, and I know neither of us are saying it's nice to be in a potentially violent atmosphere, but edge is the right word, and football's better with an edge, isn't it? I, I, I think, at least... I agree it's the way we're brought up, you know, but I think football is better with an edge, mm. you know, that's what the game's all about and 
the fans, the atmosphere play as big a part in the game as the as the players do. I know that might, but that's true. That's the fans make football. Mm. You know, we're talking here as two fans. You know, mm. about football. If without fans, football. I know plenty more famous people have said that before me. But without fans, there is no football. You know, and I think that's what drives competition and competitiveness in players as well. Mm. The sad thing for me, given that eleven Spain, is that you very nearly ended up. You were close to ending up in La Liga. Mm. The Valencia thing was real. Um, it was at a time when you were already tempted to move, to, I think, to get more football, not to get away from United. West Brom are a far better club, bigger club. <laughs> hello, West, hello, Tony. <laughs> hello, West Brom's fans. But Valencia would have been fun if it had come off. It, it, what was the situation and, and to what degree were you tempted? I was extremely tempted. You know, I would have thought it would have been a fantastic challenge for me personally. Mm and uh, a fantastic club you know mm. I was really excited about everything about it. it it started very early in the transfer window as well it was probably one of the first options I had and for me it was like wow if that could happen mm. I would love that to happen it would be great what a challenge for me and my family and everything about it to go and play in, in Spanish football for one of the biggest clubs in Spain you'd have gobbled up that cultural experience it's interesting you go immediately to the boys and to your wife that it would have been a great experience for the family which is how Phil Neville is mm. treating it now he's so and we, we Brits as footballers we, we get a bad reputation for not learning the language and Phil has gone out in the papers and said if I don't learn Spanish in three months I'm going home yeah. and you know Phil he wasn't joking either I know, yeah. but I, I believe that you'd have embraced the whole experience the, the culture the language whatever the history of the club too no? Oh, definitely. I researched even more history of the club about Valencia. I was, like, getting right into it. And, you know, it's just a shame Phil maybe didn't go six months before. Yeah. And could have um, <laughs> helped me sort that move out. You know, no, I'm, I'm really happy and I've got so much respect I, for West Brom. We both know that. We yeah. know that. And it, but, you know, it's... What a challenge it would have been. It would be something that really excited me. Unfortunately, it, it didn't happen. And, and it'll be one of those things that will maybe not regret but would maybe think back on wow imagine that had happened that would have been life's full of the ones that got away as well isn't it exactly a really striking memory of mine Carrington one day you'd help warm up an atmosphere I was going into where I didn't know Robin Van Persie very well two things really struck me in an interview with him one his absolute obsession with winning the Champions League he stated he was desperate to win it but also for me, a really strange thing, the impact that the manager had had on him, that he said from a distance he'd not been sure why Manchester United were so hard to beat and hard to play against him, but he came in and lo and behold, he went, I think he said to you or you said to me, it's him, it's, it, it's that fella. You presumably, you were there for nearly 350 games or maybe even more than that, so you had a long chunk of what Robin Van Persie enjoyed. What's that experience like of being around that guy as a as a just a manager but as a, a somebody who changes your life I presume influences your your beliefs and your behaviours what kind of experience has that been in, in human terms not just as a footballer the best thing I could I did everything to police rights for everything you, mm. you wanted to earn his well done mm. and you wanted to play for him you know you wanted to win for him you wanted to do everything for him because of with how much respect he treated you, with how much he learned you, and how much of a winner he was. You know, you were so, he had a presence, you were so overawed by him, but at the same time, feel like your father. You know, mm-hmm. he would flip between that, between one minute you were like petrified and like, oh my, you know, that sucks, and you're a little bit cautious. Mm-hmm. And then within two minutes, you were chatting away to him as if he was like a member of your family. And that was the same with everyone. I'm not just saying that because I'm Scottish, that was the same with every player. It's, it's, it's so hard to put into words of how, how, influential he is and how what made him so special but I know for a fact that everyone was just wanted it for him more than themselves sometimes mm-hmm. and he had that effect on you that he wanted to win for him and to please him and to be, for him to say well done was the ultimate compliment Would, would that be right in steering because I've, I've met him a lot over the years and I've listened to many many players of different ages and a couple of different clubs talking about him and while he's clearly a man for whom football is everything and he's soaked in the traditions of football and he's made football as a sport better, I, I'm always struck by the degree to which this, it's, this, it's called man management, but it's more than that. It's the, the human side 
his decisions, how he can treat people when he chooses to, because he can also be brusque and ruthless. There's no getting away from that. But he can make people feel special. He can teach them. He can make them give more than they knew they were capable of doing. That's an ability he's got, am I right? And secondly, that would have been transferable, I suspect, to almost anything he chose to do. Yeah, exactly. He's a winner. You know, it, no matter what he chose to do, he, he, he would have succeeded and won at because, you know, he had just that inner drive and determination. It's, it, the other thing for that was you never knew what you were going to get, you know. He could have the most simplest team talk where it was literally 20, 30 seconds mm-hmm. or he could tell you an old story mm-hmm. and, and make you a hair stand up on the back of your neck. You could come in at half-time where you've played great and he could go absolutely mental. He could come in where you've played terrible and he's calm and he picks on one or two tactical things. You didn't know what you were going to get. You know, you could walk in at 3-0 up, you could get one of the biggest bollockings of the season. Or you could walk in 1-0 down and he would be so calm and he would go to his tactical board and he would pick one or two tactics and calm everyone down and you'd go on to win the game. His team talks before Champions League games were something I'll, I'll never forget, you know, the, when it got to semi-finals, finals, quarter-finals, how calm he was and the way he went into to just tell a little story about something, about maybe someone he'd met. It's his famous one about the game of chess before, about chess before the final in Moscow, about his upbringing, about our upbringing, about anything. And he'd just tell a story, translate it to what we were about to experience and... You just went onto that pitch, full of confidence, but also with, you know, your heart and your mind full of of, of things that he'd, he'd spoke to you about. You've, you've surprised me a little bit about using the phrase the calmness before a Champions League game, but you've reminded me of something where, with ears this size, you sometimes detect things that aren't just words. And I would go, I reported on every game when United won the treble because I happened to be the United reporter then, and I remember thinking that the difference between the Alex Ferguson briefings to the media before a league game or after a league game compared to those Mondays or Tuesdays at Old Trafford when he spoke to the media, never mind the players, we were, we were unimportant, but there, there was a, a completely different aura. He would talk about football to us, he would talk about the game, he would willingly talk about the opponents when if you weren't in favour or if you uh, if you were in a bad mood on a Friday before a league game, then I can't use the word because my mum's listening, but... Mm-hmm. It's Anglo-Saxon, and you wouldn't get anything if he wasn't in the mood. In fact, he could be banned. But on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, it felt like a masterclass for us. So I recognised the, the different intensity around Manchester United, but calmness is, or a special calmness is, is a little bit of a surprise to me. I, I might have thought that there'd be more agitation, a little bit more intensity, a bit more mm. anxiety about the club. No, because his final words after every team talk was make sure you go and enjoy yourself. That was no matter whether, you know, that was his final words every time. And then the biggest thing for me was after he did his team talk, he would sit in the corner with his programme and he'd cross his leg and he'd read his programme. And that calmness almost reflected in, I've got ultimate trust in you guys. I know we're prepared from Monday all the way through to this game or however long. We've done our work now. There's nothing more I can say. I'm not going to walk around the change room like a man possessed and this mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. and then it was trust in the players mm-hmm. that he had ultimate trust in and the team he picked and belief and whether he did it on purpose or what it, it was just a calmness that reflected on the rest of the team because there's a, the greatest manager of all time in my opinion we're about to play in one of the biggest games of the season a Champions League semi-final and he's got his cup of tea and he's reading the old programme and he's chatting away to everyone maybe bringing up an old fact in the programme and, and you know because his football memory is Fantastic! He remembers every name of every player, and he'll chat to you about about something to end the program because his work's done now, and it's over mm-hmm. to you. You're in your own zone. You take him the information. He trusts you to go out and deliver. And if he feels that he needs to say any more, he'll do it at half time. I can understand how if you're a good footballer and you're well trained, and then he hands responsibility over to you, how you would rise to that. I can see the power of that. This isn't a test. <clears throat> I'd like you to tell me if you know who's saying this. If Barcelona will miss Danny, Manchester United will miss Darren Fletcher. Darren is more important than people think. His work in midfield, especially in the midfield wars in crucial matches, is very important. 
Manchester United will miss his pace and aggression in defensive actions. He eats opponents in defensive transition. In possession, he might not have the same magic as Ryan Giggs, but he's dynamic, he makes movements, he creates spaces. I like him a lot, and I believe it's not an easy decision as to how to replace him. I believe that with Darren absent, Xavi and Andres Iniesta are happy. You're starting for 10. It's between one or two. It's the one you think it is. It's Jose Mourinho. Yeah, I was going to say, it's either Fabregas or Jose Mourinho. Jose Mourinho. Now, that's, that's a pretty serious, detailed compliment, isn't it? It is, yeah. Do you recognise yourself? Uh, yeah. 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 He's describing what you strategically set out to do in every game where you're playing against opponents who can move the ball and pass the ball well. Mm. That I'm, I would imagine... That's one of the best summations of your brilliance that you've heard. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And coming from Mourinho, it's no small praise. No small praise, no. I think, look, look into that, you've got to find a role for yourself in the team. You know, Manchester United, I, I learned very quickly that I came into the team as a right winger, mm -hmm. which I'm not a right winger, but I had to do a job for the team, which mm -hmm. I did. Then eventually I started to play in central midfield and I looked to the side of me and you got Roy Keane and Paul Scholes. Roy Keane controlled the midfield. He was the boss of the midfield. So I knew that. Scolzi is technically one of the best players of all time. So you got them too. So I realised quickly, well, I'm going to have to be the legs of this team. I'm going to have to be the, the water carrier. I'm going to have to be the one who will set a tempo and, and get the ball back and drag opponents away to let those two play. And then I've got, I know I've got Ronaldo outside me. I'm going to, we want Ronaldo to attack. So if he doesn't track his full back, I'm going to be the first one over there to, to do it, to win the ball back and give it to Ronaldo. So I learned very quickly that my physical and stopping opposition and setting a tempo in a match was going to be very important if I wanted to have a long career at Manchester United. And playing against those players every day in training gave me the practice to do that. And that's not me saying I'm not a good football player. I believe I was a good football player, but you've got to look around you and realise, yeah, I'm not as good as him as that, I'm not as good as him as that, but I can do this. It speaks about intelligence, that you've taken stock, you've made a decision, you've weighed up what's the right thing to do, you've done it in 300, nearly 400 Manchester United games later and lots and lots of medals, it tells you that you made a good decision. But the way you've described it, again, in my opinion, is that that's not necessarily a defensive job you're doing. Because when you talk about winning it back, that's an offensive thing, that's a creative thing. When mm -hmm. you talk about what I love and what I was slow to learn, but when you listen to intelligent people, you pick up bits. This game of spoof that you can play to drag a player where he shouldn't want to go, but if you're cleverer than him, you can do things to open. And what he doesn't know is he's, he thinks he's fine because he's gone with you or you're going with him. And it, oh, look what just happened. Now, that to me is it's chess. It's very tactical. It's very, it, it needs intelligence and... Mm. But presumably it means that you think a lot about the game. That's not just instinctive, made up on the spot. It's product of taking time to think about football. Yeah, exactly. And you learn from experiences. You know, probably one of my most important games at United was in my first season. It's the semi-final uh, in Villa Park against Arsenal, the Invincibles team. And I was given a specific job that day to stop the error. Do you know what? I'm probably way... 70 kilos, I'm like 19. I'm going up against him. He's six foot four. He's probably the most physical player in the Premier League. But... I made it my mission, I was going to stop him playing, and I did. And, I, and, and the manager said, and your energy, run him that way and get in the box. And, and every time he gets a ball, I want you to be on top of him and to stop him playing and to stifle him. And I managed to do it that day and got a lot of praise for it, and we won the match. Walter Smith was another one who, when he came in, he pulled me to the side and, and spoke about how he thought I was very good at, he said I was a good player, but he said I was very good at get into opponents quickly and a lot of people get there but then they stop he said you get there and tackle mm -hmm. and he said don't keep doing that it's mm -hmm. very important and all of a sudden I've gone from somebody who I didn't really think was a great tackler or who loved to play midfield and get on the ball and and when if you looked at me when I any of my younger games you know I'm the one who almost was like be the more of the, the one who got on the ball and I'd have people around me to do that sort of thing but very quickly I realized that I'm playing a midfield beside two of the best midfielders of all time and one of to probably the most technical of all time, Paul Scholes, and, and Roy Keane, the most dominant midfield player. So you have to do other things that, not that they've not got, that allows them to do what they can do. And, and there's no denying that Roy was a little bit older and, 
and schools that you, we, we needed energy in the team and I was the one to get in to go on again I feel English teams did well in Europe when they played at a high tempo yeah. and Sir Alex used to speak about it and I was the trigger for the high tempo I was, I was the one who, who was the first one you know, we had Wayne Rooney and you had other players, Carlos Tevers at the time when we won the Champions League. But in the midfield, I was the one who was going to try and start that tempo mm -hmm. where it would be to go and press someone really quickly and highly and to get about people. And when we played at that tempo, we felt we could beat the technically maybe superior teams in the Champions League. Because teams like that might be overwhelmed. They literally didn't have time to think or yeah. do the, the, the things that were normal to them. And then they didn't have another game if you were... Mm -hmm on them that intelligently and that quickly is that a correct summation and because it? we didn't feel that they played at that tempo week in week out yeah. and it's not easy to turn it on no. and off and we felt with that atmosphere especially at home we didn't we were a lot more sensible away from home but at home we felt like we've got to make this game as quick as possible quick throw-ins quick free kicks keep the tempo high relentless pressure you know foreign teams like to build out from the back you know in English teams just go really direct you know so right in the face really press them and play an old-fashioned style English game, real high tempo, and know we had quality to play when we had the ball as well, because we could build up just as slowly and play at the back, and playing with speed, we felt that's how we would we could win the matches, and, and it was true, we won so many in that way. I've got no apologies to make about praising you, because the reason that I asked you to come on the big interview is that, apart from liking you, I admire you. So it's my contention, seriously, that had you not played next to schools for so long, mm -hmm. I think you'd have been better recognised as a passer. So I think you have a terrific technique, but also a brain for knowing where the ball should go, not just where can I put it, and it'll look good or it might free him. I think you're very strategic. And you remind me of Busquets. I've said that to you before, and I mean it. It's meant as a compliment. Maybe you prefer Redondo, I don't know. <laughs> but I genuinely think that that's something that is under-recognised in your career. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I think that... I think I was a very a, a good passer. I still think I'm a very good passer of the ball. But you know, you're talking about the levels of Roy. Roy Keane was one of the best passer of all I ever seen, and that's another. But everyone speaks of Roy in, Keane as in terms of what? In terms of his touch and his pace in which he passed the ball forward and always passed it forward and broke the lines of the opposition quickly. Mm -hmm. He was the best at that at breaking the opposition's line and getting attacking players onto transition. His touch was immaculate. He had the best first touch. All these things were so underrated in his game. Everyone looked at him as this ferocious competitor and box-to-box -box runner and tackler. That wasn't false, though. That wasn't false, <laughs> but with the ball, he had the bit, one of the best first touches and the best pass forward into the attacking half to break lines of the opposition I've ever seen. And then you got Paul Scold, who probably off the back, maybe got recognised even more for his control in the game abilities when Roy moved on. Mm -hmm. Because Roy controlled the midfield. Scold, he then was the one who got forward and got goals and used his technique higher up the pitch. Do you know what you're describing there? If Scholes was a better passer, or was he? If he was, what made him a better passer than Roy? If he wasn't, why is his name sacred in terms of an Englishman who could use the ball compared to Roy? Help me on that one. Um, I'm not sure, actually, because... I think I think Roy's very underrated in that respect. Scolzi is a master, though. Scolzi had the, bit, the unbelievable football brain. Scolzi could pass at five yards, ten yards, six Did yards. Did he have a bigger range of bigger passing? Bigger range of passing, okay. yeah, definitely. I think that was maybe more what I was trying... Maybe trying... Yeah, Scolzi's mm -hmm. range of passing from five to ten to control in the game to little flicks around the corner and things like that. But I, I still think that Roy's was very, very underrated. Did you ever... Phil to pay attention in training one day and get the ball off your head from schools from 50 yards away, which famously he did. Always he scared of you? <laughs> no, I was. I never. Um, I always made sure I went to the toilet before I go to the training pitch. <laughs> and no, he was famous for it, you know. But he's that's that's the level of Paul. That's that's what he did. You know, he's an unbelievable player. I played with so many unbelievable players that that he he does stand out as probably the most all around special. It's complete coincidence that you name those two. But I want to ask about something that I suppose, well, if it were me, it would be a painful memory. You were falsely suspended for Rome. They both missed the camp. Now, I think for legitimate bookings, each of them, I was at the Turin game, and I was sorry for them, but they were both genuine bookings. Yours wasn't. Yours was a mistake, so Alex called it a tragedy. And I was there the night before the game, impoverished, out with journalists. I was a freelance. I couldn't afford to pay my dinner. I was sitting there moping around, and who should walk along the side of the pavement but Ted Beckham? So he stops and says hello, because we did our 
ups and downs over the years, but we'd become very friendly. And he was like, I'm just walking around Rome to soak this up. You know, it's beautiful city and it's red everywhere. Because, you know, it wasn't just about David for him anymore. It was like, he's one of the most passionate United fans. Ever. So he was just gushing with joy about this. But you had to spend a lot of time on your own wandering around Rome that day because you weren't part of it. What was what were those couple of days like? What do you take from it as a lesson about life or 2009? What does it mean to you now? Yeah, it's massive regret, but I've basically my burning desire, like from a child, was to play in a Champions League final, and I've like three times I've been like I was on the been on the bench twice and never got on the pitch and. Maybe in the final that I definitely would have started. I get the red card, and I've just never quite achieved that. And the, the burning desire and drive that that gave me, though, at United, probably helped me produce good performances and stay there as long mm. as I did in longevity and and things like that. Um, I spoke to my dad very quickly after the game, and he went because there was talk of like getting rescinded and that. He's like, forget about it. He said, get there next year. Concentrate on winning the league, and I took him took that on board. In a lot of ways, it, your, your stock gets higher when you miss a game. And I think that's a perfect example of that for me. And that might sound, but, you know, people, we would have done this or we missed. And sometimes, in a, by default, you become a better player. Mm. And I think that's true because, and even in your times when you're out of the side, when you're ill, you're not been there for a while, you know, people, oh, we missed. We, you, people remember the good times, don't they? I think that's a, a saying. But even if my stock went higher and the Man United fans... I still, I would still change it to play in that final, yeah. definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. I expect that, aside from that passion to lift the cup and to play in that game and to fulfil a boyhood dream, the, the competitor in you and the analyst in you would have been looking at those two Barcelona sides. I'm leaving Moscow aside now, because effectively, you're a Champions League winner. I might ask in a minute how you feel about that, but the history books will always say, you know, Dan Fletcher was part of a Champions League winning squad. But analytically, I'm fairly sure you'd have liked to done what Josie was talking about there and set yourself about stopping what Alex said, you know, they'll kill you with your passing and from my humble point of view, even if he listens to this, I think particularly in 2011 he picked the wrong team. You weren't available in 2009 so you couldn't rescind the red card but boy, they got a lot of space in the two games. Now I've followed Alex Ferguson's career closer than he has and hear Alex Ferguson say after Rome, that goal after nine minutes killed us. And that's the most atypical Alex Ferguson phrase ever. How can an Alex Ferguson team be beaten after nine minutes at 1-0? Mm-hmm. But it was because that team wouldn't really wouldn't give the ball back. And I think both in 2009 and 11, when we, we spoke a lot before Wembley, and I was convinced that you were going to make it and that you would make a difference. I think, genuinely, I thought, maybe you think it's, you're laughing at me now, maybe you think it's not your place to say it, but I think United would have been a damn sight closer to winning it had you been doing what you've just talked about, which was your art of making sure the good players can't play as well as they want to. That must be a separate frustration that you didn't get at. Test yourself against Xavi and Iniesta and Messi at their best and, and maybe beat them. No, I think in 2009... I think it was a big part of our game plan and the way we, me not being there, as I spoke about, being the one to set a tempo mm-hmm. and, and how we beat Arsenal in the semi-finals and how we, you know, we were relentless in pressing and, and getting against them and setting a tempo in the match. And um, I f- personally think we were favourites in that final. I know a lot of people won't believe it, but and going in 2009, I felt like, I think maybe that, not that we didn't respect Barcelona, but there was no fear of Barcelona at that time. And I think that might have ultimately helped us go in and win the match. They weren't regarded as the great team as they were. They were on the, they were going towards that. That was almost like the game Agreed. that stamped it. Totally right. And we felt, I felt we would still win the game in without me. And I think the manager speaks about people not following the game plan to the, to the letter. And we might get away with that in other games, but maybe you don't get away with it in Champions League final. And he still holds true that the players didn't fulfil what was expected of them or what was asked of them in the game. And maybe we did change the style and we would play because of, because I wasn't in right midfield. There. And I think we did a little bit because we, we didn't really go to relentlessly press them and stop them playing as maybe we should have or could have. I regret it because I feel like I could have made a difference. Yep. I know people will laugh at that. No, I asked you the question and I'm yeah. saying it sincerely. Yeah, It's not praise because we're sitting no. across the table. I think if somebody can't see that, they don't watch football very well. Mm-hmm. Not just because of what you did or what Man United played like, but what Barcelona don't like. All right, we, neither of us can say you'd have won the game, you wouldn't have won the no. game, but if you even look at how the first goal comes, 
and the amount of room that a 60% fit Andres Iniesta has to run with the ball before feeding it to Eto. Again, from my point of view. Now, it didn't mean no harm as a freelance journalist in Barcelona for them to win it. So I'm not actually saying I regret it, but it sticks out a mile. Yeah, exactly. And we start the game so well. And, you know, in 2009, I was physically very, very, mm-hmm. you know, per- like powerful and, and box to box and stamina levels were very, very high. I was, you know, I'd started to get a bit of strength and, you know, not being the biggest physique in, in ever. And, and I could have I could have done it for 90 minutes, pressed and, and closed down and harried and made it so difficult. And, um, the team was built to play that day. That's how we got to the final. You know, Carlos Tevez, Wayne Rooney. You know, they could run and press all day. We we, we had the capabilities of doing it, but we didn't follow our game plan. And, and we started the game very well and should go in the lead. But it's, it's true in the both games. For 20 minutes, we managed to be able to sort of impact the game. But over 90, we we just couldn't do it. And ultimately especially in 2011, they completely dominate and control the game. That's because I don't think I was physically able no, to do it in 2011. I've just come back from my illness, the first bout of it, and looking back, I was very fortunate to even make the bench. I think, in your head, you think you are, but looking back, I don't think I, I was physically at a point where I could have done what I'd have liked to have done in that final. In, 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 in life, you know, you've beaten the illness, it was debilitating, depressing, horrible experience for you and your family. But you have beaten it, you're healthy, you're fit, you're young, you're talented. So rubbish though that experience was, you know, you, we move on and life is good. But if you look at 2011, if you look and say, my illness meant I couldn't have been the real Dan Fletcher on the pitch. So therefore, without saying you were a spectator, tell me a little bit about, because we, I think I've never heard an outpouring of praise for a football match maybe with the exception of when I was growing up in 1970, for that game in particular. And Man United fans would text me or go on Twitter and say, we were, we were well beaten. No soreness, like, almost like it was good to watch them. What, what were the things about that side as you watched them? What was that experience of being close but not involved in that, that greatest team, club team ever maybe that night at Wembley? What, what do you think of them? It was the ultimate performance as well as the ultimate. You know, so you can have great teams, but they put in the ultimate performance on the ultimate stage, the Champions League final, and they they performed to the highest level I think they could. And I think to, for the, the great team to do that on such an occasion, I think it speaks volumes as well. You know, we get great performances; they can happen in league matches, they can happen in group stages of the Champions League. But for them to execute in a Champions League final the way they did, we, we didn't lay a glove on them that night. We, we scored a fantastic goal. It's an unbelievably good goal, isn't it? And, and I think, I can't remember too many other chances apart from that. <laughs> and it took us scoring a fantastic goal to even to get a goal. And it was almost like, it's undefendable, the goal. I think if Arsenal even look at it, the move, 1-2, the way we scored, the finish, everything about it, that speaks volumes of the match that it took us scoring an unbelievable passing one touch move and an unbelievable finish to get one goal in the match when the rest of the time we didn't really lay a glove on them. I think it's reminded me of the 2009 discussion we just had because you scored a goal because of the brilliant... Who, I can't remember who presses, but I think it's a Barcelona throw-in. And United press down your right-hand side and press and win it at pace, getting to the ball quickly, getting in, the ball's away, and then suddenly bish, bash, bosh, and Wayne does to something beautiful. But, I mean... To me, that still says 2009, 2011, had you been not suspended or fully fit in 2011, I can see in that little incident the difference it, it, it might have made. I was speaking to Abidal the other day who came through a, a similar experience to you in that you know he, he'd fought back from a tumour. He'd left a note to himself. I don't know if you know this. He played England at Wembley before he was d- diagnosed with his tumour in 2010, that season. And he, he, he said that they had a bad for doing that the French team they would leave themselves notes if they were playing the Stade de France and they were going to be back there for a major qualifier or there was a big cup final they would leave a note to themselves tuck it away see if anybody found it like kids really but Abidal left himself a little note in winter 2010 when France beat England 2-1 Benzema scored and he went I am coming back this note is to you I'll be here in May and he went back and it, it had been tidied up it had been cleaned it had been taken away but on that night, you, you wouldn't have been conscious of it at the time, but you must have been conscious later that Puyol and Xavi got together and said to the lads, we're going we're gonna to have Abidal the arm man, he's going to lift the cup because he's just beaten cancer. Maybe that sounds obvious to do, but to me, I think it's not, not a lot of people in football would do that. You can't get Platini or Blatter out of the trophy shop because they want to be still holding up the idiots that they are. 
But they were like, I tell you what, the greatest moment of our lives, let's, let's give it to the French guy. Yeah. You've been in dressing rooms all your life. What kind of, what does that make you feel like? What, what do you think of that gesture? I think it, it speaks volume for the, the, the team that they had, the morale they had, what leaders they were. And, you know, to win the Champions League, to be captain, that's what you think about, to go and lift the trophy. And to give that up, everyone might say that's because they've done it before or whatever, but to give that up to someone... I think it shows the power of football, and I experienced it with my illness, about how people contact that you would never believe and wish you luck and think about you and, and ask you how you're doing in certain situations. And I think it puts rivalry aside, it puts winning stuff aside, and it puts, puts somebody who's ultimately could have lost their life mm-hmm. and who's showed determination and courage to battle back. And, and then for his teammates to give him that honour to go and lift the Champions League for Barcelona, you know, I think it, it maybe speaks for of why they were such a great team as well, because they had the respect for each other, they had great leaders with compassion, and not only were they fantastic footballers, but to be a great team, it's your environment, it's your dressing room that drives you as well, you know, people, you, there's been so many great individuals, but they not only don't make a great team, mm-hmm. and then having a great team means having a great dressing room. And all my time at Manchester United, we, we had a fantastic dressing room that, that respected each other and drove each other forward. And I think you can see from Puyol and Xavi that they ran the dressing room, they ran the squad, they drove the squad to be the best. And then they also made the decisions that ultimately allowed Avidal to lift the trophy. I think that speaks volumes of them as people and also tells you why they were such a great team. I mean, I agree with everything that you've said there, but my experience is that not everybody in a dressing room necessarily gets on or even likes each other. You use the word respect, mm. so they don't necessarily need to be best buddy, but there's a lot of tension and jealousy and rivalry in football dressing rooms. That's fair, true? Yeah, that's true, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, because you want to be in the team and only 11 can play, and you know other players want to be the stars. I think it's recognising that when that goes beyond, it's good to have that. And I think everyone should have that. Everyone should want to be in the team. I think you should always think that you should be playing when you're not because that drives you, but that's when it goes overboard, when it turns to jealousy, when it starts affecting the squad, I think that's when it becomes a problem. And I think that that soon gets alienated and eventually passes to the manager that this is going beyond a competitive drive now, this is becoming a poison in the dressing room. And ultimately that was always dealt with. Because Sir Alex is good at spotting and... Or or maybe maybe, maybe some of the players deal with it too, because you have to have your own little... Kangaroo Court, without the manager being involved mm. all the time, I suspect. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, and leaders don't accept it. They've got different ways of showing you. The schools he never spoke to you, he'd kick clumsy in the training ground to show you. The kids, they'd be the same, you know. They'd, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have a go at you in the dressing room as such or, or pick you out like that, but they'd maybe team together and go, all right, we'll show them on the training ground today. And they'd literally kick, look, kick clumps out of them. And that was their way of sending the message, Roy Keane would be in your face and just tell you mm-hmm. and pull you aside. You know, there's different ways of doing it, and it quickly it quickly gets solved. And the manager speaks to higher ranked players in the squad as well, and asks how's he settling, what's happening there, what's the situation, and and makes a decision. Ultimately, it's the best thing for the team. You lead, I think. I think when those people you've been talking about moved on, you, you, I know you stepped into the vacuum and, and attempted to keep the spirit and and to show examples, maybe in a different way than schools and gigs did, but. Was that a natural thing to you? Was it satisfying? Was it? I felt it was my role because it came comfortably to me and I'd, I'd, I'd learned from great leaders. I think it's in you, but I think it depends on what your upbringing is and what you've been around. I've, I, was in, I was in the dressing room with a lot with leaders. Mm. You know, I first got in the dressing room, Roy Keane, Lauren Blanc, the class of 92, Gary Neville, they had, they were like, they had their own little core group. They were leaders amongst in themselves. And I think then you look around the dressing room and when big leaders and players go, you feel the responsibility that you have to step up to do it. And as long as it's not, you're not forcing yourself to be someone you're not, I think it, it came quite naturally to me. And I respected what, how they helped me and I know how I felt like I could help foreign players sell. I know I could help young players and I know how important a, a, a good, vibrant dressing room is to ultimately have a successful team. I want to talk about, without criticising your parenting, I want to talk about another Manchester United leader. Because Rooney seems to think that your boys are going to play for England. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> he Did, does, yeah. He gifted them, what, England shirts? With... Yeah, before every tournament or when the New England top comes out, there's always <laughs> a, 
there's always a delivery and of... I, I don't think that's friendship or generosity. Uh, I think that's recruitment, and I'm not, I'm not having it. And they need to support a team in the tournament, and he says Scotland don't qualify, so there's always Rooney 10 strips, full shorts, yeah, that they that they love getting. And, and now, Where are we at in this debate? Because in due course, you'll move on, and, and they, are, they are our future. <laughs> they, we need... These lads, you know, no, 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 no. If you ask them, they say they're Scottish. Come on, yeah, without a shadow of like. a doubt, they come in. Everyone even says they've got Scottish accents. I don't know how that's possible, but they do detect a Scottish twang. And when the school teacher asks you to come in and not say certain words, that's when I know I'm doing a good job. <laughs> well, and before you give me a slap round the head, I'll move off the lads and on to Rooney because it's my contention that he's underappreciated. That people don't understand. What an extraordinary talent England have had. And I, I, I find that bewildering. But I think, I don't know, but I think you're quite close. I think you feel the same, well, you know much better than me, but you feel the same as me, that this is a, a much better player than England has appreciated. A much better player maybe even than United fans appreciate. Yeah, but definitely I can't speak highly enough of him mm. because I know how good he is and know how. And I do feel he's underrated, definitely, because... His record's there, you know, he's broke the all-time England goal-scoring record. He's going to break the Manchester United one. If you look at his, his career, he's, you know, he's had seasons where they've been fantastic. But he's the ultimate team player, which is ultimately uh, will be um, detrimental to, to his goal-scoring records and to some of his performances. Because he worked so hard off the ball and he played so much on the left wing, for mm-hmm. example, and... Sacrificed so much for the team. Particularly in that Ronaldo season, when when Ronaldo's goal record went off the scale, and he hadn't wanted to stay. That was the season when, in his what he should have been at Real Madrid, Alec phoned him and said, "Don't go." And he went, "Okay." He phoned Ramon Calderon, didn't go, and Wayne set up goal after goal after goal from the left, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. If you look at his assists and goals and and work rate and output in matches, it's it's off the scale. You know, people look at how long he's played for and how many games he's played, but if you looked at this, the data as well in terms of his intensity outputs in the matches, they're through the roof. He's, you know, he's a physical phenomenon that doesn't get the respect I think it deserves. And, and rightly so, I think, I think Wayne was quick to realise that Ronaldo was on this goal-scoring, unbelievable mm-hmm. run. And ultimately, he would maybe have to do more defensive work for the team to win. And he, and he, and he did that because he's a team player. But the most important thing for Wayne was to become a champion for to win to win as a team to win the Champions League to win league titles because it was hit home at Manchester United that great players are looked back on because they win and that was always hit, hit home whether that was because to take away the individual or to, to not the biggest thing was when you look back on it's not how much money you've earned how many goals you scored it's how many things you've won and that was hit home because Alex Ferguson used Ryan Giggs as the example of being the greatest Manchester United player because of how many thing, how many trophies he'd won. How many leagues did you win? Five. You'll be remembered at Manchester United in that case, on that on that rule. Yeah, I, 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 I remember a story. I was de- I'd, well, I've, won, I've won everything. I'd won the FA Cup my first season, five Premier Leagues, the Champions League, the World Club Cup. And then there was the, the League Cup that I hadn't won. I'd been dropped from a final, rightly so, because of my performance the week before when they first won it against Wigan. Then I got rested for a final against Tottenham because we had Inter Milan in the Champions League on the, on the midweek. So I got rested from one, not even in the squad. So it was the only medal I didn't have. And then we get to the final against um, Aston Villa, I think 2010, and 2009, 2010. And so Alex pulls me for it because we've got an important game. Yeah, I'm thinking not playing it. I said to him, boss, you can't do it again. <laughs> and I went, what do you mean? He goes, I go, you've... I've not won this trophy I've been left out of the last two finals it's, it's my last one to complete the set almost and he looks at me and I'm like oh, what are you joking he's like you're killing me I've got a big game next week I'm like yeah but it's a cup final like what's <laughs> my bigger than that he goes we need to win the league and anyway I end up playing and winning and it was my final one to complete the set so called and it was, it's amazing how much that final and that win means to me and it might be the least important it's a league cup medal but it was the one to complete the set and to finally say that I'd won everything. And, it, and it, I took a great a lot of pride in that because obviously schools and, and all the great players have done it. But some, a lot of the lads haven't won the FA Cup and they've not completed the set. And I know it still drives them on. Like Wayne, example, he's desperate to win the FA Cup because it completes the set. But that, yeah. But I mean, because it's a, an audio medium, not visual, 
people can't see exactly how the adrenaline's running through your body again at the and that makes me love this game that we're talking about that simply the idea of winning okay maybe the least important medal is the one that I have to have it that's the winner's gene coming out in you that wasn't like I'd like a little neat collection in my in my trophy cabinet at home that's like I'm going to win that Mm. it's coming out of you isn't it yeah exactly because I wanted to win everything and but I want you know you have little things like yeah can I get another league title can I get this but I, w- I did have a thing like can I complete the set can I win everything that was possible to win for Manchester United mm-hmm. and look back at my career and, and say to my kids there you go what one do you want to see do you want to see the league medal oh, there it is do you want to see the Champions League medal there it is you know they've got them in their room now they play with them all my medals I'll show you them in a minute they they do their own medal ceremonies with Champions League medals and league <laughs> medals because you know I want them to enjoy them I shouldn't tell the story but when I was growing up when I was a Tiny little titch. I was my mum I was very keen on. There was Scots who were representing us in swimming in the Commonwealth Games, and I think it was Ian Black and Bobby McGregor. And our little Champions League ceremony, was like, we used to we used to get timed. <laughs> We'd swim from one end of the bath to the other. <laughs> now we weren't, you know, we weren't pygmies, and it wasn't a particularly big bath. So I think back, and as your boys will think back, and God, we used to play Champions League medal ceremonies with Dad's medals. So what, what was that all about? But it's better than me and my brother's been timed as we swam from one end of the bath to the other. It's time to say uh, thank you because you've got a life and it's time to stop talking about football because you'll very well know that if you didn't stop me, we'd be here till next Tuesday talking <laughs> about it. Thanks for the pleasure of sharing a career well spent. One day, there's so much more to talk about in your life and career. One day we'll maybe ask if we can come back. Yeah. For the meantime, I think you've made a lot of people enjoy this time with you. Dan, many thanks. Thank you very much, Graham. How enjoyable was that? Fletcher in full flow. You've heard the voice of a man who I think is going to go on to be an exceptional manager, a leader of men, tactically astute. Um, I find Darren not only really engaging company, somebody I'd call a friend, but tremendously football smart too. Think about this. Despite the terrible um, illnesses that he had to fight against, to go through hell against, to rehabilitate himself physically, knowing that it was already obligatory that he'd have another um, surgical intervention, which would mean putting him back to zero. But he was definitely obliged to get fully fit again, even with no hope of that being the last time he went through a full rehab. He still totaled nearly 350 matches for a Manchester United that was as powerful, as as deep in resources during Darren's time than it had been probably ever in its history. That says something really special about Darren Fletcher. Count him as a friend, but when I texted him late in his Manchester United career to say to him, you should think about talking to your agent about getting to Football Club Barcelona um, to be a player who will joust with Sergio Busquets for a place in central midfield. It was serious, not friendship. That's how highly I rate his judgment of the pass, um, the tempo of a game, how to rob and then move the ball quickly. Darren was a pleasure to talk to. Obviously, Backpage and I hope that you took as much satisfaction that it that engaged you as much as it did us. If you've enjoyed listening to it and you want this type of podcast to continue with us, Go to kickstarter.com, search for Graham Hunter, the big interview. You'll find all that you need to know about our campaign. It lasts a month, but in that month, the entire future of the big interview rests on you. Without your help, it won't continue. If you're thinking about getting on board, supporting us, and being part of the big interview, please do it now. This podcast is produced by me and Backpage, edited by the exceptional Alex Aidy. The music here, what good music is too, is by Beer Jacket. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting so strongly over the months since April. We're going to have another big interview with a superb guest along in a week's time. Meantime, join us, support us, make this podcast yours, make it survive.